The one thing that's uh, in co uh, commonality with all the meetings is we start with the land acknowledgement. So here to do the land acknowledgement that we first uh, used at Indigenous Peoples Day last year, and it's one that you'll see cut and you can cut and paste from the chat, use it if you're doing presentations in Sitka. Uh, but this is a land acknowledgement, just a nice respectful way to start acknowledge people that have been here uh, for time immemorial. So I'd like to turn over to one of the partners who's helping us in a variety of ways. She works at SAFE, which is one of the um, organizations that's helped to make all this happen. So Tina, would you please uh, uh, share the land acknowledgement for today? Thanks, Doug. Welcome, everybody. We'd like to start by recognizing that we're on Thinket Ani. Ani is the Thinket word for land, and Thinket people have been in this place for over 10,000 years. It's very important to recognize this historical fact and to appreciate that the Thinket people have been excellent stewards and have lived out the traditional tribal values around balance, respect, and caring for the earth that sustains us all. So for taking wonderful care of this special place for time immemorial, we say thank you and gunoshtish. Great, thanks so much, Tina. So we're here from noon to one, and the plan is we're gonna uh, see a great presentation. There may be some times where you can interact with um, if Dr. Med has questions in the chat box, but we'll be able to uh, see his slides and hear his presentation. If you do have questions, you can send them in the chat and it will go to the host, which is Leah Mason, which is uh, somebody we all need to thank for doing all these things. So Leah will get the questions and then she's going to send those out to Dr. Kraft, who's the campus director, and then Tina. Uh, on the planning team, and they're going to try to find some themes. And at the end, we'll have a chance uh, for our, our speaker for today, Dr. Med, to answer a few of your questions. So please take good notes. You can send questions throughout, but please don't send them to everyone. Just send them right to that chat box that says, ask a question. So this is the second of our five uh, presenters. Last week, we had Tim Wise. On Thursday, we have Hugh Vasquez. At the end, we'll give you a little bit of a preview of what is coming up. But one thing that's special about this is after Dr. Med uh, presents today, we're going to have a first Thursday lunch and learn. And this is going to be for people that are interested in making changes in their world and in their organization. So it's directed towards uh, policy and decision makers and how can we take some of this great information and implement it. And so there'll be a chance to hear from peers and learn from peers and follow up. So we're excited for that. You'll get invited to that. It's on October 1st. But now I'm gonna turn over to the campus director, Dr. Paul Kraft. He's gonna do uh, an intro for our featured speaker for today, uh, Dr. Kraft. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Dr. Amir F. Ahmad is an organizational strategist who helps institutions and leaders address diversity and inclusion, equity and intercultural development through consulting, coaching, group facilitation and keynote speeches. A frequently requested speaker nationwide, Dr. Ahmed's approach is grounded in a commitment to inclusive excellence in organizations and communities. He brings his identity as a son of Indian Muslim immigrants and extensive years as an intercultural and diversity consultant as the sources of a pivotal understanding of the depth of diversity and inclusion work. Throughout his career, Dr. Ahmed has worked with large organizations, higher education institutions, nonprofit agencies, schools, and community groups to create understanding and change among key constituents and institutional leaders. His thought leadership and keen sense of the latest trends inform, informs his approaches to helping groups address potential areas of opportunity to grow and develop. Dr. Ahmed incorporates deep theoretical knowledge of the field combined with a variety of methods, including storytelling, discourse on current events and connections to art and music in order to move audiences to profound awarenesses, a profound awareness of issues and next steps. He's published key opinion pieces and has been featured in media such as MSNBC, documentary film and other national press outlets for his commentary and critical perspectives on news and significant topics in society. Dr. Ahmed is the founder and CEO of AFA Diversity Consulting, LLC, a consulting practice dedicated to en enhancing the development of organizations through efforts around leadership, professional development, assessment, and strategic change. 
In addition to his consulting work, Dr. Ahmed serves as faculty at the Summer and Winter Institutes for Intercultural Communication. So on behalf of the folks here at the uh, University of Alaska Southeast and uh, Sitka, uh, Southeast Alaska and throughout Alaska, um, Dr. Ahmed, we wanna say welcome and we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. Uh, uh, and thank you all for, for attending today. Uh, it truly is my honor. I appreciate the opportunity to engage you on this uh, very important and relevant topic. Um, I wanted to also, before I do anything, also acknowledge the um, indigenous people on the land that I am on. Um, I, I'm on Nanatuck land, and of course we wanna acknowledge the native people in each of the four directions in relationship to, to us. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the labor that is required for each of us to be able to participate, um, including myself, um, in this uh, important forum. Um, as we have, uh, many people have become increasingly aware that we are completely interdependent on the leadership of so many other people, uh, some of which we are now referring to as essential workers. Um, the reality is that we do not have access to the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the electricity, and so much more if it's not for the labor of so many other people that oftentimes we don't see uh, um, and recognize as absolutely necessary for us to be able to demonstrate the leadership that we demonstrate in our respective work. Um, and I wanna thank everyone involved in organizing this important space for us today. Um, I'm speaking to you at a very, historic time with regards to the issues of social justice uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in the United States. Uh, and I want to, before anything, make sure that we are being mindful of all these, the lives that, are being, that have been lost. Um, and of course, this is not an exhaustive list of all individuals who've been subject to state violence and of course the ongoing um, violence uh, directed towards uh, indigenous women uh, that's ongoing, and again, the countless others that uh, we, um, uh, we're we not naming here today. Uh, and we state unequivocally that Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Trans Lives Matter, Native Lives Matter, and Black Native Lives Matter. Um, and of course, as we know, in this time, there's a rising consciousness and awareness and recognition that, um, that it is time for change, that is no longer acceptable uh, for us to continue with racist iconography and, and language um, as part of our public discourse. Uh, and fortunately, we're starting to see concrete uh, examples of that beginning to change, including uh, the Washington pro football team. Uh, and then one thing around my guiding philosophy I wanna share before we get into some of the content is to be uh, mindful of the fact that access without support is not opportunity. A lot of times we talk about access to the higher education, access to resources, and, uh, but the reality is that, uh, that when people are coming from marginalized backgrounds and identities and groups, uh, it's uh, not just about the access to, to, to resources, uh, but to translate that, uh, that, that access into meaningful opportunities, it requires uh, support. Uh, and that, and how do we um, adapt and, and uh, shift and, 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 and focus uh, our support for others um, who are marginalized around uh, backgrounds that we may not share in order to translate access um, to, to various uh, resources and opportunities into meaningful opportunities. Now, uh, before I go forward, uh, I, I want to let you know that I'm going to be using uh, a number of cartoons um, to make some of my points around intercultural leadership. Um, and I, I usually draw from the far side uh, as the source of many of my cartoons. I tend to like their cartoons. And so I want you to take a look at this uh, image. Now you have a fisherman and a bear, and they're both going about trying to fish. Now. If you look at the fisherman, he's looking at the bear quite quizzically, uh, a little bit perplexed, um, confused about how the bear is going about catching the fish. And at the same time, I imagine the bear is a little bit confused about how the fisherman is going about catching fish. He got that little string, like what's that gonna do? At the same time, I would argue they're both just as likely to catch fish. 
And my only point here is that oftentimes when we see someone going about doing things in a way that we're unfamiliar or that's different from what we would do, uh, we just oftentimes dismiss it, right? We try to correct it. We try to tell other people to do something the way we would do it, right? But the reality is that, they're, that they potentially can get to the same result, right? And so my point is that we, we don't have to always do things the same way to achieve the same result, right? And we don't just do this across groups and identities, we do this within groups as well. So in this one, it says, Jesse, are you mad, sick, crazy? We don't do that around here. And Jesse's cooking burgers. Now, I'm gonna hope that's an impossible burger, uh, but uh, the, the, the point is that within groups, we set parameters of what it means to be part of that group or what it means to be black, what it means to be native, what it means to be uh, uh, queer and so forth and so on. Uh, at the same time, while we wanna have an open mind about lots of different perspectives, right? Not every perspective is gonna get us where we wanna go. So in this one, it says, Shh, here comes one now. Now, to all of us, it's very clear that this is not gonna work out very well for them. But I want you to think about that box like an organization. And oftentimes in organizations, we tell ourselves that we have such great ideas when on the outside looking in, it, it might be obvious or evident that uh, it might not be the best way to go about doing things. And so, uh, and, and so we wanna have parameters uh, to our consideration of multiple perspectives, right? We want to account for m as many perspectives as we can uh, while setting parameters of, of perspectives that aren't helpful in getting us where we want to go. And we have to be aware of our audience. So in this one, it says, inadvertently, Roy dooms the entire earth to annihilation when in an attempt to be friendly, he seizes their leader by the head and shakes vigorously. Now, Roy means no harm but the implications of his actions are disastrous. Uh, and so Roy is using a universal rule. He's using the golden rule, which is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The challenge is that the golden rule doesn't account for what the other person wants. It assumes that the other person wants the same thing you do. So I would advocate for the platinum rule, which is to do unto others as they would do or have done unto themselves. So what's the difference? The platinum rule requires you to account for the perspective of someone else. And I would call that empathy. Empathy as opposed to sympathy, right? Sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody else, which can be kind of disempowering actually, right? Empathy is more to shift perspectives and put yourself in someone else's shoes. And actually the language I use for empathy is validating someone else's experience as true for them. Right, so it, do, it, does, it doesn't require agreement to have empathy. Uh, so I'll give you an example. In my uh, work settings in, in American higher education, I've mostly worked with uh, people who identify as women and uh, most of my supervisors, most of my colleagues. Um, and I remember early in my career, a colleague came up to me and said, you know, every time there's this guy around, he makes me feel uncomfortable. And my response was, oh, I'm sure he doesn't mean anything by it. That's not me demonstrating empathy, right? It doesn't make me a bad person. It just means that I didn't validate that person's experience as true for her, right? It didn't matter what I thought. And some may say, well, why does that matter? The reality is that what is the likelihood that she's going to want to come and, uh, to me about something in the future? It's not very likely, right? And so... What, what a lack of empathy in relationships, uh, whether professional or personal, it creates unnecessary barriers, right? Uh, in, in deepening uh, our, our trust for one another and our ability to create meaningful uh, working or personal relationships. And this breakthrough uh, from, from the golden rule to the platinum rule is a key, key breakthrough in the process of what we refer to as the development of intercultural sensitivity. And this model was developed by Dr. Milton J. Bennett, and it's a six-stage model. And the idea is that, uh, that we have the capacity to, to uh, increasingly um, effectively navigate the complexity of similarities and differences. Um, and one of the most important things, before we get into the details of this model, 
one of the most important details to think about is just to think of ourselves within a process of development in which we can have the capacity to get better at navigating who we are in relationship to all different kinds of people. Uh, and that that's a process that takes time. It's not snap your fingers and it's all sorted out. What I would often say is that this, this is, area of education is the one part of education we don't treat like education. It's oftentimes framed as you either get it or don't get it. And we say, well, that person, that person really gets it. That person, no, that person doesn't get it. Well, and now, you know, it's woke or not woke with this generation, right? So, but here's the thing, if I don't get it, whatever that means, how do I go from not getting it to getting it, right? Again, we don't treat any other part of education like this, right? You don't teach someone algebra if they don't know arithmetic. You don't teach someone calculus if they don't know algebra, right? Learning is developmental and scaffolded, right? One of the reasons why we don't treat, uh, we oftentimes don't treat um, this aspect of education the same way is because it's so personal. It's tied to how we identify and understand ourselves in the world. And when you're marginalized, you just want someone to understand it, right? Unfortunately, I don't have enough evidence that demonstrates to me that that's how most people learn, uh, right? Most people go through a process of, of development over time where they increasingly develop the capacity to be more effective as they navigate who they are in relationship to all different kinds of people. So when you look at this model, I, it's important to start from um, the left side, uh, these more ethnocentric stages of development. And ethnocentric means primarily operating out of your own worldview. Now, um, you may have heard uh, people say um, that uh, the term cultural competence. Well, I would argue that everybody is culturally competent. If you weren't culturally competent, you wouldn't stop at stop, stop signs. Everybody is aware of their, of their own reality. The question is, how do you navigate your reality in relationship to everybody else's, right? So in denial, that first stage, you're aware of your own cultural reality, your own social reality, and what you understand your world and your life to be, right? But everything else is kind of a big blob of stuff. You can't really discern or, uh, much difference across different kinds of people uh, or groups. Um, and there's a lack of curiosity, right? Um, and so uh, you can think about these things at both the interpersonal level as well as the group uh, organizational or even societal level. So, so an example of denial on an uh, organizational level would be an, a policy that existed in the U.S. military until the 1990s referred to as don't ask, don't tell, right? You may recall that, right? So the idea was don't ask, don't tell, don't even talk about sexual orientation, right? Let's just act like it's not there, right? That's denial, right? We're just going to not even engage, uh, engage that type of difference, right? Defense is the stage of dualism, of us versus them. And usually we think the us is better than the them. So people in defense tend to use broad categories to refer to various groups of people like, uh, like Latino or Asian and can't give you a lot of nuanced, uh, nuances within those various groups. Um, and so uh, in, with, with, uh, in the defense stage, there's an emphasis on difference, on what makes us different. Um, and uh, there's an interesting aspect of defense known as reversal, where we reverse the us and the them. And we think the them is better than the us. So this is something you see commonly with people who re return from the Peace Corps or uh, from a study abroad uh, trip. Uh, and they come back and they, they say, you know, you know who really gets it? The Africans, they get it. Americans were terrible, things like that, right? The, and so in this frame, that is still considered dualism, right? That's still that kind of these um, us, for, us, them kind of dynamics, right? The idea as you move across this continuum is you're moving into greater complexity and being able to navigate, pick up and navigate more nuance, right? Uh, and so... For, as an educator, if someone is operating primarily in defense, I want to focus on the similarities, right? Because they're really focused on what's making us different. But what happens is that as, you, as people start to learn more about what makes us similar, we move into a stage referred to as minimization, where we over-focus on similarities. Um, and this is the golden rule territory. This is where we really focus on what makes us similar. So people in minimization tend to say things like, well, at the end of the day, we're all just human beings. 
you know, we all have our food and music and family and, you know, these universal truths, right? These values that cut across all human beings. And there's truth to that. But what happens is that there's an over-focus uh, and we start to mask the fact that there are real differences. Uh, and, and so uh, people in minimization are essentially assuming that others are like us, whatever the us is, right? And so what that does, is, this is the stage of colorblindness where we erase what makes others different from what, uh, in their experience and, and their background um, in order for us to feel more comfortable. Um, and actually when you're of a marginalized group, oftentimes minimization is an adaptive strategy uh, in order to create less conflict and create less waves and, uh, and, and to be perceived as less disruptive by the dominant group. Um, one characterization of minimization is what we, ref what we refer to as insistent niceness. So at one point I lived in Minnesota in my life, uh, and if you may be familiar with the concept of Minnesota nice, uh, and I'm not sure if this uh, is, I imagine this might be the case uh, uh, quite prevalent where you live as well, um, but the, this insistent niceness and almost to a degree in which we can't, uh, uh, we can't have uh, conflict or debate or, uh, or uh, engage in that which makes us different in a way that might be deemed to be uncomfortable by the dominant group. So this breakthrough from minimization, the golden rule into the platinum rule, is this breakthrough into this, uh, these ethno-relative stages of development, starting with acceptance. So acceptance is a stage in, we, in which we value diversity, where we value what makes us similar and what makes us different to one another. Um, uh, and uh, we say things like diversity is a good thing, um, uh, and, and, but if this is a stage with talk with little action. Um, on an organizational level, it might, it might mean that we're saying that diversity is good, we value this, but there's not a lot of policies, practices, and procedures that are backing that up. Um, on the interpersonal level, um, it's more of a, you know, intellectually, um, and my, uh, I believe and I value diversity, I think it's a good thing, but I'm not behaviorally doing anything different to adapt to different kinds of people, um, uh, to be more inclusive of, diff of more kinds of people. Um, and so the, one thing that we uh, characterize as this that we refer to as liberal paralysis, that, that we're open-minded about lots of different things, but, we're, but we're, we feel paralyzed about what we're actually going to do. Uh, so adaptation is when we actually have a behavioral shift that occurs. Uh, where we begin to adapt in different contexts and environment and situations and communicate and be effective in those various contexts. Now, for somebody like me, I've been doing that my whole life. Um, the moment I stepped out of my house in, in Ohio or for my immigrant community uh, and family, I had to adapt my communication. Style. So there's actually an inequity in the, who is tending to have to adapt more than others, right? Um, but the idea is that to a degree, we all adapt. Uh, to it, right? So most of us, when we go to work, we don't communicate exactly the same way we do at home, right? Most of us would get fired if we talked at, at work the way we talk at home, right? So all of us are doing it somewhat, but some of us are having to do it a lot more than others. And then integration is just simply a deepening of that same process, is a synthesizing and an ability to fluidly move across lots of different contexts and environments and situations. And again, this is a lifelong process of, of learning, growing, and developing that all of us go through um, in some way, shape, or form, uh, and it's unending. Uh, and so in order to be able to, to develop this capacity, we have to acknowledge the context that we're operating in. So in this one, it says, well, I guess I'll have the ham and eggs, and he's sitting in a room full of pigs and chickens, okay? Probably not a good idea, right? Now, some people say, well, why should I have to adapt, right? Why should I have to change who I am in these different environments? Well, I would argue we're not changing who we are when we shift and adapt our communication. We're changing our behavior. We're, we're shifting our communication to be effective in a certain context than another versus another, right? The question then becomes the, the inequity question, and we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But these are the core competencies and skills to work on to position us to engage in that development. And what's important is that it does not require us to learn everything about every kind of person, right? 
that's helpful to learn specific things about different groups and identities and backgrounds, but these are the core skills to position you to be more likely to be successful as you engage across similarities and differences and to be able to learn from mistakes and to grow and develop uh, and, and to be able to pick up uh, 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 that which makes you similar or different to someone along the way and to adapt your behavior accordingly to be more effective. Um, so, and I would argue self-awareness, the absolute foundation, that your ability to be able to know and understand who you are, where you come from, what your background is, your, uh, your, um, your values, um, your experiences, your bias, your styles, th these all comprise your foundational identity. And that is what gives you the reference point to be able to empathize, to be able to, to validate someone else's experience as true for them, right? Because if you don't have a level of self-awareness, uh, it becomes very difficult to be able to truly deeply empathize with the experience of someone else and, uh, in a way that's meaningful. So let me give you an example. So in, in the United States, um, you, we have this concept of whiteness, the social construction uh, of race, specifically into whiteness. Now, when European immigrants came to the United States, they did not think of themselves as white. They thought of themselves as Irish and German and Italian and so forth and so on. But we had this assimilation process, a pressure to assimilate uh, from the power elite of the United States that pressured European immigrants to assimilate into the notion of whiteness. Of course, there were groups like Irish, uh, that were not, uh, Italians, Jews, that were not considered to be white. Um, you may recall the phrase, Irish need not apply, right? So, but over time, there, uh, there, with the pressure of assimilation, there ended up being this absorbing. And in fact, to get a promotion and a job, you needed to assimilate into this notion of whiteness. Uh, and actually, you were expected to move into neighborhoods that were deemed white neighborhoods and to give up those ethnic identities. And and as a result, there's been this loss of identity. So growing up, I had people that said to me, well, I wish I had a culture like you, Amir. And I'm like, you do have a culture, very different from mine. Um, and, um, but what, it's, what it did is that it created a, a disconnect and a, root, and a lack of rootedness in one's identity. Because I was like, well, somebody passed down something to you, right? It's a, everybody has something that's been passed down to you. Uh, and that has shaped and influenced and impacted how you s see yourself and others in the world, right? Now, let me give you a concrete example. Native American burial grounds. Now, some people say, well, why do we have to stop a construction product project because native artifacts were found? Well, my response to that is, how would you feel if someone wanted to build a Walmart on your grandparents' grave? You probably wouldn't like it very much because it's sacred to you. Right? And the things that make up our identity are sacred to us. And when it's violated, it's incredibly painful. Right? And so when you understand what those things are for you, you begin to empathize and understand why that, even if it's not the same thing, you begin to understand why it would be so painful and harmful to be violating those things for someone else. Um, tolerance for, for ambiguity, being okay with the fact that you don't know all the details all the time, and that's okay. Right? So I get the question a lot, Amir, what are you? And I'm like, I'm a person. Well, no, well, where are you from? Well, I'm from Ohio. No, 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 where are you really from? And of course, white folks don't get this second, where are you really from? Uh, and of course, if we ever said this to a native person, that would be incredibly insult, even further insulting. Uh, and, and so again, the, um, there's a, it, it is important for us to recognize that nobody has the uh, is entitled to know everything about everybody uh, somebody else, especially the moment we meet them. And for me, um, uh, and many people, there's this repeated what we refer to as microaggressions over and over and over again. These slights that um, that constantly because the subtext of that question um, is, uh, can you help me understand why you're not white? <laughs> I mean, that's basically what someone is saying when they when they say, where are you really from, right? And, you know, I don't, I don't feel the need to share my entire ancestral lineage the, every the moment I meet somebody. And, you know, my nieces and nephews are, you know, they're here. My family came to the United States in 1967. Like, how many generations do we have to be here uh, before we don't have to explain our en entire ancestral lineage at the moment we meet it? Uh, so. Um, so, again, being okay with the fact that we don't know all the details. Flexibility and thought and behavior. Being okay with the fact that there's different ways to think and do things, right? Think about the fisherman and the bear. Um, now, 
you may say when I gave the example of where are you really from, you can you might say, well, I'm just curious, you know. Well, it's good to be curious. If you're not curious, you don't even want to know, right? But can we sit with the, uh, the patients long enough for people to disclose things about themselves as they're ready to share those things, right? Um, so I'm going to share a, a quick video um, and uh, that kind of gets at this. I'm going to have to share a different uh, different window uh, briefly. Um, Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. Ham Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well... Hello, Gamdaf! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you. Let's get a small tea, small tea! Double, double, toil and trouble! Mind the gap! Beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Pip, pip! Cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a Korean thing. Okay, so, you know, obviously it's a comic take on uh, what I was referring to of the where are you from question. But, um, but again, the, the, the norming of being American as being white. If you notice for her, it was her great grandmother that came from Korea and for him, it was only his grandparents. But yet within two generations, he's regular American, he's white American. And for her, she's othered and, uh, and so forth. And of course, you know, approached uh, in a manner that um, is expected to, uh, is expecting to, to share something. And, uh, and this is also a common thing around uh, the food reference, like for, for me, someone says, you know, oh, you're, you're Indian, uh, I like tandoori chicken and non bread. And I'm like, great, I like hamburgers. Like, that's not even the food that we eat from the part of India that my family's from. But okay, but um, my point is that these repeated experiences, they create, again, barriers in relationships. And, that, and for me, I know that if when somebody does that with me, I'm like, all right, I'm good. Like, I'm not really trying to develop a very deep meaningful relationship uh um again like you know you you build a relationship and then people share the things that they're, they're comfortable sharing um over time so this is my definition uh for intercultural competence and when i say the word the term competence i'm talking about one's ability to pick up the nuances as they navigate similarities and differences so um if you think about competence as related to wine tasting, I'm very incompetent when it comes to wine tasting. I know that there's red and white wine, but people who are highly competent can give you the year, the region, the altitude, the slope on the mountain that they came from, right? They pick up on the nuances and the subtleties. And so intercultural competence is about picking up on the subtleties, right? Um, and using those skills and competencies we talked about uh, to navigate the complexity of similarities and differences and uh, accounting for the various social cultural contexts, um, including uh, one's privilege and marginality, their social identities and the inequities related to those social identities that we that we carry. Now, to connect intercultural uh, leadership, we have to think about what what characterizes leadership, 
And historically, leadership development has been really a model of assimilation uh, for anybody who's not white and male and straight uh, and, and, and cisgendered and so forth. Uh, and oftentimes leadership is framed as hierarchical and positional and someone at the top of a hierarchy. Uh, and really it's the, there's been this pressure to assimilate into this, uh, this notion of a leadership, and which means that those of us who don't fit neatly and nicely, we have to kind of give up parts of ourselves and, and, and contort ourselves into this notion of being a leader. Well, if you look at Susan Comovis's leadership identity development model, it really uh, parallels the, the intercultural development model uh, in that it moves from a more individualized way uh, of uh, thinking about uh, and positional way of thinking about leadership. At, uh, and it's a developmental process to, to get, come into a more decentralized notion of leadership. It's more group and societal focus. So it's a six stage model that moves from this more individual self focus to this more group society focus. And if, in quite honestly, for many uh, groups uh, around the world, this more decentralized notion of leadership is traditionally how leadership has been viewed, that everybody is a leader in their role, right? And that, uh, and that we are totally interdependent on, on each other's leader, leadership in order for us to be able to demonstrate our own leadership, right? So just think, thinking about essential workers and how our ability to do anything that we're doing is completely dependent on all those individuals demonstrating their leadership in, um, in what they're doing. Uh, and that, that sense of interdependence um, and the competencies to develop along this continuum of leadership development are the, exactly the same. These same competencies of self-awareness, empathy, tolerance for ambiguity, flexibility of thought and behavior, and curiosity and patience, they are the same competencies to develop. And so the reality is that uh, intercultural development and leadership development are interdependent. And the only point of this uh, slide is for you to think about um, this process of intercultural development and leadership development as, as one and the same, that these, that these things happen in the 21st century, these things ha are interdependent, that you cannot be an effective leader in the 21st century if you do not develop those intercultural skills that position you to be more likely to be successful as you work across all different kinds of backgrounds, identities, and groups. And so good leadership is inclusive leadership and inclusive leadership is good leadership. Uh, and, and, and that uh, you really need to de develop these skills in order to be an effective leader um, in the world that we live in today. Now, I talked about this positional hierarchical um, kind of framing of leadership. And when we think about that type of leadership, that's, in that's a model of leadership in which power is from the top down, right? Uh, and it fosters competition oftentimes it involves a sense of ego, an elevated individual above others, uh, and tends to view leadership as transactional, that, that, um, that others must do what they need to do, uh, and by them doing what, what they do, I do what I do, and that transaction is what makes my leadership valid. Inclusive leadership is from the bottom up, right, in which uh, uh, collaboration is fostered, uh, and it requires a level of humility, right? As opposed to ego, the idea that of, no, I'm not elevated and more important, but that but my leadership is completely interdependent with your leadership. Uh, and that my ability to be effective at what I do in my role and my contribution um, is requires the investment and commitment to you in your leadership. Uh, and so it's a more of a transformational mode of leadership. And I'll talk about the difference between transactional and transformational right now, right? And again, the idea is that you do, that um, is not one or the other in terms of transactional versus transformational leadership, but the idea is that transactional leadership is negotiated uh, or uh, or non-negotiated agreement. If you do this, you get that. I, I work for you, so I get paid. Right? Um, that's a, it's a transaction, and sometimes it's needed. Right? So let's just say if you work in an emergency room, right? You, you need transactional leadership in order for the, the work to get done. But transformational leadership is what builds the trust so that when we're transactional in getting things done, um, there, there isn't necessarily the, kind of the unnecessary conflict that creates barriers in our ability to be able to get things done. So it's a pro 
process that changes people involves engaging our emotions, our ethics, our standards, and treating people as full human beings and respecting them for who they are and what they bring to the table, right? So we, we want the, oh, these four eyes of transformational leadership uh, that, of idealized influence in which we behave as a leader in a manner that others want to emulate and aspire to, the model behavior, uh, the inspirational motivation, that, uh, the ins inspiring others to seek to achieve new heights, the intellectual stimulation the, where, in which you foster the, uh, an empowering environment in which people's ideas are considered and valued, uh, and, you, uh, and, and individual consideration, understanding the skills, talents, and, and strengths that each person brings, and you're concerned about their personal matters, uh, factors in, in their lives, and account for that and recognize that. Again, when people feel valued and respected, they're more motivated, they work harder, they're invested, they're more likely to retain them, they, they're more willing to contribute uh, in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. And when people feel devalued, they check out and they, may, they, they do just enough to not get fired. And, uh, and so what you, what you end up paying, you're paying for, you're paying for a half a person, right? Because they're just doing just enough because they don't feel a level of investment, ownership, and commitment into what uh, is happening in the organization. Because I, if I feel disrespected, why should I invest more in myself? And so the difference uh, in this approach is the difference between problem solving versus what we refer to as appreciative inquiry. Now, problem solving is, is this kind of basis that, that, that there are problems that need to be fixed. It's this deficit orientation in thinking about how to address issues and, and matters about how to improve in an organization. Appreciative inquiry is a strength-based management practice in which we appreciate and value what we do best. And we emphasize, what do we do well? How do we do more of that? And how do we expand that and start crowding out the bad? And so we focus on what, what people and what uh, uh, organizations and groups um, bring to the table. And how do we value and respect that and grow that? and use that as an opportunity to envision possibilities, to engage in dialogue about how, how we can get there and then and potentially foster innovation about what will be. Uh, before I, I, I leave, I wanna kind of give you this um, model on thinking about uh, culture. And I use a broad definition of culture here. Um, and that a lot of times when we think about what makes us similar and different, we tend to, if, if you think about it like an iceberg, we tend to focus on the one tenth, tenth of culture uh, that, is at the, that is above the surface, right? Uh, the more visible parts of what makes people uh, 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 part of a group or identity, right? Where nine tenths of identity and culture is primarily out of our service, eye behavior, ordering of time, nature of friendship, uh, and so forth. Now, I want you to think about two icebergs coming together. Where are they gonna hit, at the top or the bottom? at the bottom, right? Most conflict is around this stuff at the bottom, right? These more subtle things, right? Um, and when we don't understand how, uh, how um, we're different in these more subtle ways, and that we have to navigate that, we don't necessarily always uh, understand what's happening in terms of engagement and where the source of conflict is. For example, high behavior. Um, how many of you know someone, or maybe you're one of those people, and I maybe have been one of these people at some point, uh, who said, I don't trust someone unless they look me in the eye. I judge someone's character based on whether they look me in the eye. Well, what if you come from a background in which the most disrespectful thing you could do is to look at a supervisor, a teacher, somebody of respect in the eye, or maybe across genders, okay? Well, if I made the judgment that I, that I view someone as uh, with uh, less character or, or I don't value or respect someone for not behaving in a way that, uh, that I've associated a set of values to, right? That may be very different for that person. Well, now I've imposed a standard that is simply that if that person does not uh, operate the way that I want to, um, then, then I don't deem that person to be acceptable. And that becomes a source of conflict, and it's also a way of marginalizing someone. Um, before we, we wrap up, I want to make sure that you think about the difference between intent versus impact. Most people's intentions are good, right? That's something we can assume in most interactions, um, right? Uh, and so 
in order to be able to, to, to recognize uh, 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 the impact of behavior, right? We need to validate, appre appreciate, and investigate. Validate someone else's experience when they share uh, that they, they've been uh, impacted or marginalized. Appreciate them for, for, for sharing and contributing uh, what they're sharing and contributing about what they're experiencing and find out more. Try to understand uh, more and recognize that when someone is marginalized around racism, sexism, or other form of discrimination, that person lives with the fact that it could happen at any time. So a lot of times our interactions that we're having with people are not just about the interaction you're having. It's about all the interactions that person had before, uh, you, uh, as well as your interaction. And maybe something about your interaction is triggered, uh, is triggering something deeper. And sometimes there's trauma around these things, right? And so it's really important to not blame people for their ongoing experience of being marginalized around a particular part of their identity and focus on the impact and not simply, because a lot of times we explain things away by saying, well, their intentions were good. Yes. And what is the impact? And how do we deal and how, how do we navigate that? So um, as, as we wrap up, I want one more cartoon. And this one, it says, wonderful, just wonderful, so much for instilling in them a sense of awe. Now, when people look at this, they oftentimes look at the aliens at the top or the aliens at the bottom. But I want you to notice the staircase. Those staircases are uneven. There's no handrails. Somebody was going to fall down those staircase, the staircases. Now, I want you to think about that, that staircase like a system. One of my mentors taught me that every system is exquisitely designed to produce the results that it gets. Every system is exquisitely designed to produce the results that it gets. This system was designed to produce that result. And what do we do? Uh, when, uh, when people do exactly what the system was designed to do, we blame the victim. We blame poor people for being poor, we blame people of color for racism, blame women for sexism, and so forth and so on, right? As opposed to thinking, what do we need to do to fix that system, right? And let's get some handrails in there. Let's even out those steps so that we're not setting people up for failure, right? And that's, uh, that's, what, uh, um, that's how we need to think about um, as related to our agent and target identities, the areas in which we have privilege, which we have access to social power versus the areas in which we're targets, where we're subject to social power and we're marginalized around it. And we are agents and targets at the same time. And I want you to think about it like a tailwind and a headwind. And a, when you have an agent identity, it's like a tailwind that's getting you where you wanna go even faster than you expected and you don't even really notice it. And when, you have, when you're a target, it's more like a headwind and it's making it harder for you. It doesn't mean you can't get to where you want to go to, but you really notice it. And our tendency is to focus our tar on our target identities and not our agent identities, right? But what if all of us worked on our agent identities? What if all of us were working on the areas in which I, I, we benefit? So for me, that's as a male, as a heterosexual, as an able-bodied individual, and all these different kinds of ways in which I benefit, but that might not be true around race and it might not be true around uh, religion. And so I would argue, if you think about it like a wheel, we all, if we all did our work around um, the, our age and identities, I believe that's how you dismantle uh, these systems of power that marginalize people. So I know that we're in a very overwhelming time and I wanna leave you with an important thing because sometimes it feels like this is too big. How do I deal with it? How do, I, how do we create change? How, does, how do I change the world? If you take it all on, it's gonna be impossible. It's gonna be too overwhelming. Think about your sphere of influence. What are the things you can impact? And the appropriate response is according to your ability. Responsibility is about responding to your ability. What are the things that you can do in your sphere of influence? And that uh, is what intercultural leadership is all about. So thank you very much. Um, I will, I'll leave you with um, my working definition. This is the uh, of diversity. Diversity is a fact of difference. Uh, that may make a difference in how we interact uh, with uh, one another, communities, institutions, and ourselves. Uh, eye color is not a difference that makes a difference in our society, but race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. In the business case for, for diversity it is productivity, safety, cost, and legality. That irrespective of the moral and ethical case that we want to make for why we want equitable and inclusive um, uh, uh, organizations and spaces, Productivity, safety, cost, legality, that, uh, that organizations benefit irrespective of the moral and ethical case. So it's important to know and understand that.
thank you very much. I'm ha happy to engage in some Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. It's a wonderful presentation. We are recording this for educational purposes and we're gonna have a lot to go back and learn from. A couple questions have come in. Uh, Dr. Kraft and Tina are gonna, are gonna put one. I was gonna ask one while we get that in the chat. Um, we're having this monthly follow-up where we're bringing local leaders together and talk about how they can work in their sphere of influence and make uh, um, some changes to make organizations that are healthier, more inclusive, et cetera. Is there any examples from your work with different groups um, that you want to kind of uh, share or highlight or things that we could think about as we try to start this process of, of growing together and, and sharing and and every month we're going to check in on the first Thursday and try to see if we can have policies and procedures and have things that have some real world, real, real world benefits in where we're at. Yeah, on the organizations I work in, I talk about the difference between tactics and strategy. Lots of organizations and institutions have lots of tactics. Um, and what that translates into is pockets of good work in some places and other areas in which it might have nothing to do with what's going on. Right. And so the development of a comprehensive strategy, right, across a number of different areas that are tailored to the specific needs of one's area, but also connect to a broader strategy. Right. So that the, 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 the tactics that are developed are uh, for the service of implementing and, and meeting the goals of that strategy. Right. So that we're all swimming in the same direction as opposed to in a bunch of different directions. Right. And this is one of the challenges, particularly in higher education, uh, in which um, we have silos, right? Um, and the left hand oftentimes doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And so how do we have that broad-based strategy? And then how do we translate that into each of our respective areas and embed it and integrate it into what we do to make our work better, as opposed to viewing it as an add-on, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not an add-on. It is integral for our ability to be effective at what we do, right? Um, and so that, that, that is to me a, a key overarching theme that I think is incredibly important uh, for people to have a North Star uh, around. Excellent, thank you for that. We had a, another, question that, uh, another question that came in the chat, people can see that. Um, it says, appreciative inquiry is the most startling when people are asked to find a good thing in a bad experience. Do you have any examples of something amazing that came from a quote unquote failure? For me? Yeah. I mean, I tried to share that example um, around the gender dynamic. Um, and honestly, um, early in my career, I was not engaging in intercultural work. I was very focused on um, anti-racism and social justice, and I'm still com very committed to that. But what I noticed early in my career was that oftentimes I was causing people to go running for the hills, particularly white people. And I was kind of hitting people over the head with stuff they were overwhelmed by and not ready for. And what I found is that I wasn't necessarily creating the change I wanted to see at the institution that I was serving it, right? And so part of why I approach things even today, the way that I did, today is because, um, you know, how, I want to think about how do we bring people in the conversation, right? And I had to, what, part of what I had to do, and this is the part that a lot of times we don't talk about, a lot of it is about self-work, right? So for myself, I was so motivated and driven by my anger and frustration around racism and other um, uh, aspects of, of inequity that I was becoming attached to wanting to make people believe that, uh, the things that I want to believe, that I want people to believe, right? But the reality is that people have free will. Um, and so then the question became, how do I influence others where they want to be able to take ownership and responsibility over their own learning and development, right? And so now the approach over time has increasingly become, become about that, which required me to do enough self-work to let go of the attachment to somebody else thinking and believing exactly what I want them to think and believe right away, right? Uh, and the reality is that learning and development doesn't work that way for most people. So I needed to come through that de development and maturity and understand that I can, the best I can do is influence as best as I can and, and support other people and meet them where they're at and, 
and, and position them to continue to go on that journey. Great, we'll have time for one last one and then we'll, we'll preview the rest of the speaker series. Uh, you mentioned in the model starting at ethnocentric and then moving to ethno relative stages. So starting with uh, denial and defenses, moving to minimization, all the way to acceptance, adaptation and integration. If what would be your advice to somebody who is new to this work and they might be more in that ethnocentric uh, frame, what is your advice for, and, and for all of us, I think having a beginner's mind has its, its place, uh, but do you have any kind of words of wisdom and maybe thinking of somebody who's new to the field or even if you were talking to yourself at the beginning of your career, do you, could, could you kind of close this out with any advice for, for mm -hmm. how we can uh, kind of start this, this journey of educating ourselves? Yeah. Be patient with yourself, be generous, be willing to learn, grow and develop and know that it's not going to it's not going to happen overnight right and you're going to make mistakes because you're human so we learn we grow and then when we um when we um are impacted in a negative way um by someone else's behavior um we have to do enough self-work so that it's um so that we can find ways to to hold people accountable for problematic behavior without, um, without um, reacting versus responding, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and so that's, I think, you know, cause when we react, we're giving our power away. We're letting someone else dictate who we're going to be in that moment. When we respond, it requires a level of critical reflection and alignment with who I'm trying to be in the world, irrespective of someone else making mistakes and how they, and maybe saying something dumb or disrespectful. And so how do I work through that so that I'm not giving that person the power to dictate who I'm going to be in this moment? Yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. That is the, the end of our time. I'm gonna ask if Leah can put the screenshot of the rest of the speaker series. This was number two of five speakers. On Thursday, we have uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Vasquez, and that should be a really special workshop from 10 until noon. So you can sign up. All of our, our questions are, are all of our, these sessions are free thanks to the UAS. Um, and that one's creating conditions of equity across race, class, gender, and cultural lines. And then we have uh, Megan Redshirt Shaw. She's going to be our evening speaker on Monday, the 21st, one week from today. And her talk, her keynote talk is called um, on Native Identity and Activism. And then on uh, a week from Thursday, Dion Brady Howard, local educator, 20 years at Montage High School, she's gonna have one called uh, Bringing It Home on Making Our Communities in Southeast Stronger. So you still have lots of chances, lots of great speakers. The follow-up for this is those first Thursday of the month leaders lunches. The first one is on October 1st. It's gonna be from 12 until one, you're welcome to come to that. And then we have the One Community, One Book, which is, the book is called The Racial Healing Handbook. And Dr. Annalise Singh is gonna zoom in with us on December 2nd. So we have to finish our homework, read through the book. It's a lot of the, the transformation that Dr. Ahmed was, was speaking about. It's a wonderful uh, book and we've got um, some copies that are already here, uh, but please join us December 2nd for that Zoom as we talk with the author. She'll be Zooming in from Tulane where she's a professor. So that is the uh, upcoming, you can see on your screen, our next one is Thursday with Hugh, powerful workshop, 10 to noon. We hope that you can make it. One more time, we, we can't unmute, but I'm clapping on behalf of all of us, uh, Amir. That was a great presentation, so much wonderful information and not just information, but some inspiration and, and insights there. So I'm excited to keep working on this and I hope you are too. And that is it. We're Thank at you. time. Thanks so much. Uh, and we hope to see you at the next training. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody. Bye everybody.